Things engineers love. Bells and whistles. Fine-tuning performance. Getting things just right. Things engineers are not really fond of. Worst case scenarios. Designing for what might be. And redoing work, whether it's their own or somebody else's. And today, we're talking about all of these things, but specifically within the bounds of motor control design, MOSFETs, and bringing electronic control units to market. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. When it comes to designing a motor control application, passing EMC testing, reducing power dissipation, and mitigating supply chain issues are crucial design concerns to keep in mind. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Rick Borowski from Infineon and I explore the role that MOSFETs play in motor control design, the value that adaptive MOSFET control can have for these types of designs, and how Infineon can help you jumpstart your next motor control design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Rick. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. All right. So we're talking about advanced gate drive for motor control today. But Rick, when it comes to bringing an ECU to market, what kind of things should engineers keep in mind? Well, if you've ever worked in motor control trying to bring an ECU to market, you have a to-do list. And on that to-do list includes passing your EMC testing, managing, really reducing power dissipation, and these days, more than ever, actually mitigating supply chain issues. So, Rick, before we get into all of those areas, let's start at the beginning and talk about the process of how a MOSFET turns on. Right, good idea. Let's, let's set some basics here. So to turn on a MOSFET, you look at the screen right here, we have the electrical symbol for a MOSFET. We give it an input signal, and that should turn on the output of the MOSFET and current flows through it, right? Right. Wrong. That's actually, that's the ideal of a switch turning on, that the output reflects the input. The reality is actually very, very different. A MOSFET does not simply switch on. There are multiple phases because the MOSFET is a system. And we want to put the current through the channel, but first we have to charge up these various internal capacitances. And these are like, like buckets. You have to fill them up with water before they can flow beyond them. To turn off the MOSFET, we then have to also empty these buckets. We have to drain these capacitors. And also MOSFETs come with this inherent body diode across the channel. And sometimes current is flowing through this body diode, leading to a high power dissipation. Okay, so... The MOSFET doesn't just turn on because there are multiple phases here because it's a system, right, Rick? That's right. Let's take a walk through those phases. We can better understand them. So yes, it is a multi-stage process. And you can see the different behaviors of the output current here in blue versus the output voltage in yellow, and even the internal behavior of the MOSFET gate, which is in black. And let's look a little bit closer at each step. So before the channel can begin to conduct, those, as I mentioned, those internal capacitances need to be charged up to the gate threshold of the MOSFET. We can see the output current of the device lags the signal at the input. Put the signal in in red, really nothing happens for a little bit until this first capacitor is charged up. And then once that gate threshold is reached, the channel begins to conduct. But the on-state resistance, or the RDS on resistance from drain to source in the on-state, it remains quite high, but it's only temporary. So we keep charging up those capacitors. And then in the next phase, the output current is flowing and it's constant, but the gate continues to charge, further enhancing that channel, reducing the resistance, and also the voltage across the device reduces. And note that the voltage on the gate in black is constant while these charges are filling in. And this is known as the Miller Plateau, named for the man who actually discovered this phenomenon. This is really the danger zone. Here's where we see switching losses and a lot of EMC noise as the switch is changing from the off state to the on state. So in a mechanical switch, like an actual, like a light switch or a relay, this is like that spark that jumps across the air gap when the two metal surfaces are either just making or breaking contacts. So once we get out of the Miller Plateau, out of this EMC danger zone, the channel is still not yet fully enhanced. So there's still some unnecessary uh, power losses happening, losses heat. So still some inefficient conducting. And then eventually that gate is fully charged up. So now we have the lowest resistance and thus the lowest possible power dissipation. And now the MOSFET is fully on. 
So we see that the MOSFET turn on actually has many phases that we need to get through. Okay, so what about the turn off process? Well, the turn off is actually is the same process, but in reverse. Except now we're actually sinking the current is the term. We actually have to pull the charge out of the gates. Literally the same process, but just in reverse. Okay. So can we talk about the different methods to drive MOSFET control gates as well? And first, can you talk a bit about the different kinds of MOSFET drivers? Sure, sure. So I guess one of the most primitive versions was actually voltage-controlled, a very classic voltage-controlled MOSFET driver. So you're basically just switching the battery voltage to the gate of the MOSFET. And, well, that may be a little bit dangerous, so you may want to actually have some kind of control about how fast those capacitors charge up. You would manage this with external components. So you can see in the diagram here on the left, you know, some resistors, some diodes that you use to try to give some control to the current going into the device or the amount of current flowing back out of the device. So it's a lot of trial and error in this tuning. And then once you do make your selections, once you fix those components, there's no further adaptation of the switching times as possible. You're just, you're locked into what you have in the hardware and that's it. So hardware determined charge current and switching behavior. But then, uh, you know, things get better as always, you know, in the world of silicon, we try to keep innovating. So the next step was a constant current controlled MOSFET. So instead of just delivering a voltage now, having a device that can deliver a current that you can control, but it's constant. It's either one current to charge it, one current to discharge it, and that's all you get. So it enables you know, some kind of an open loop control of that MOSFET slew rate. The slew rate is you know, the diagonal line you can see on the right-hand side as the voltage drops, really the switch from the off state to the on state. That's the slew rate. So maybe you could pick your current based upon some input parameters like the voltage uh, or the temperature or some other settings in your production. But one of the drawbacks of this is that all those different phases you see on the right-hand side, you know, the waveforms, they're all dependent upon each other. So what does the turn-on process look like for this kind of driver? Okay, so yeah, so if it's constant current, raising or lowering the current extends or contracts the entire envelope of the switching behavior. So all these waveforms are dependent on each other. So sometimes maybe you want a slower slew rate for better EMC behavior, but that'll give you more switching losses. So, but in any case, if you slow down the slew rate, you slow, you know, if you lower the current, the entire waveform stretches. So you can see on the left-hand side, a higher input current, and you get through the waveform, you know, with one rate of speed. But if you lower that current, it takes longer to get through all of those phases. And uh, if you make that current maybe too low, you might have too much dead time between the switching cycles. And this can lead to maybe limitations in duty cycles. When you're trying to do PWM, you may not be able to get as fine of a control as you would like. So there are definitely some limitations with constant current control. So what can we do uh, to improve this again? Well, let's try a configurable current profile. So instead of simply like one current during turn on or one current during turn off, you could actually have a charge current profile highlighted here now in orange. And you can see on the upper right hand side, there are multiple phases to the input current. So it gives the possibility to adjust, you know, the turn on delay time independently from the rise time. You could uh, apply a higher pre-charge current, that first bump you see to get to the Miller plateau or the slew rate area quickly. And then you put in the desired slew rate you're looking for. And then after you get out of the EMC danger zone, you could hit it again with a higher post-charge current to get to that full enhancement and the lowest power dissipation as quickly as possible. You pick a profile and you get what you get. But maybe you're picking this profile now based upon some input parameters like voltage, temperature, or production settings, but still open loop control. All right, how can we make this into closed loop control? Well, one thing would be is to actually bring some feedback back into the circuit here. So you can measure what's happening at the MOSFET. So if you're giving it this current charge profile, you can say, you know, Am I getting what I want? Is this MOSFET switching fast enough? And that feedback can come back into the microcontroller, for example, and the microcontroller can then make some decisions and adapt the switching times as you go. So in other words, if you're trying to get it to switch in a certain amount of time and you find out it's switching too slowly, you can bump up some of these currents to try to get it to move more quickly. Or maybe it's the opposite. If it's charging too quickly and uh, the MOSFET's switching faster than you want, you tune those currents, those multiple phases. So this is possible. However, this comes with a lot of software overhead. You know, you're now responsible to write the software, to do all the measurements, make the judgments, and send out the new decisions. So, Rick, is it possible to integrate the regulation loop in the MOSFET driver? Oh, I'm glad you asked, because that's literally why I'm here today. We have actually integrated this adaptive MOSFET control into the driver itself. So in this case, the microcontroller only configures the switching times, which is a very simple setup setting some bits and some SPI registers. 
And then the adaptation of the current profiles is actually done by the MOSFET driver itself. So it reduces the microcontroller workload and really reduces the amount of software that an engineer would have to write. The microcontroller merely configures the device, delivering a starting point and some target timing. And the gate driver actually self-adapts the currents to meet this timing. So now we have closed loop regulation of these different switching phases without the need to write a lot of extensive software. Cool. Now, Rick, how does constant current compare with adaptive MOSFET control? The short answer is you can see the waveforms on the right are much shorter than the waveforms on the left. We get through some of these inefficient conducting phases much, much more quickly with multi-stage slew rate control. Okay, so Rick, let's circle back to that list you mentioned earlier. How is adaptive MOSFET control going to help accomplish these issues? Okay, well, let's start at the top of the list here, passing EMC testing. So what we see here in this animation is the driver is actually, in this case, changing the slew rate while the dead time holds steady. So you can see in the pink, actually, the angle of that slew rate is actually moving back and forth. But the dead time itself, the time from when the input signal first appears in yellow to when the device starts conducting in pink, that, you notice, is not changing. So with constant current, you would see this whole waveform really stretching and, and, and moving all together. But in this case, we are controlling just the slew rate independently of everything else. Now let's turn this example around the other way. This next page here, now we're controlling the dead time independent of the switching slope. So the angle of the pink, you see that remains constant, but that dead time, the space between the input signal and when the device is conducting, that is now moving back and forth. So we're giving the engineers all these levers, these bells and whistles that they can turn and modify, and it's simple, simple adjustments in SPI registers. This thing can do a lot of adaptation, self-adaptation on the fly. So very easy to tweak and tune the performance during development. Okay, so now that we've passed EMC testing, next is reducing our power dissipation, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have a couple of ways to do that. But first, let's talk about some of the challenges of dealing with MOSFETs. Often the specification of the MOSFET parameters, the ones relevant for switching control, they don't include any minimum or some as maximum values. And so you can see how much they even vary here from the typical value to the maximum value. Boy, that's the double. And as far as the minimum goes, it's not even specified. So we don't really know what we're getting. Sometimes you only get a typical and you don't get a minimum and a maximum. Or they might be specified only at a very certain temperature or current or voltage. So in the end, we don't know really what currents we need to do the charging. And we don't know how the device is going to behave. It winds up being this broad spectrum of what might be. And you wind up having to design to worst case scenarios if you can define them. You know, what can we do about this? Because this is where actually a lot of the losses occur. So now, as we know, most of the heat, the power dissipation is created during the switching phase of the MOSFET. Again, the steepest part of this curve as it goes from off state to on state. And these switching times, they're proportional to the, the, the MOSFET gate charge. So our closed loop regulation of adaptive MOSFET control compensates for these tolerances. So let me show you an example here. So looking at the typical values versus the maximum values, the math works out that in this case, you burn about almost two watts of power, a difference of one watt of power, and that's about 25 Kelvin of temperature rise. But because the adaptive MOSFET control is going to compensate for this, it's going to self-adjust until you get the timing that you're looking for. It removes this tolerance. So a typical device and a maximum device are actually going to behave the same way. We're regulating the switching times, not just giving it one set of currents. So in the end, we're saving about a watt of power here. You can predict the behavior. You're going to get what you want because the device will self-adapt. So this is switching losses. So Rick, are there any other areas where we can reduce our power dissipation beyond switching losses? Oh yeah, switching losses is definitely the big one, but beyond switching losses, we can look at freewheeling losses. So let's look at a motor drive example here where in this case, we're spinning a unidirectional motor using a half bridge. So the motor drives in only one direction and we have two MOSFETs that are hooked up to the motor drive here. And you can see in the dark blue, that's the current flow. And these two MOSFETs have some very different functions. So one is called the freewheeling MOSFET. In this case, it's the high side MOSFET. And the low side MOSFET is the active MOSFET, the one that actually drives the motor. So the motor is on, the motor is spinning, and the current is flowing through the low side MOSFET. And let's walk through now the PWM cycle. When we shut the motor off, the motor wants to keep spinning. There's some inertia there, and it's going to keep rolling for a bit. And so actually, current will be flying back into the system out of the motor now. The motor actually becomes a generator, and that current has to go somewhere. And it goes through the high-side MOSFET. So initially, it's going to go through the body diode of that MOSFET. 
And, well, there's a voltage drop across the diode, so power is voltage times current. So we're going to get a lot of heat through that diode unless we can actually turn on that MOSFET. So if we turn on that high side MOSFET, as you see here, now the current goes to the channel. It goes to the low RDS on, the low resistance path, and that reduces the power dissipation. In a PWM cycle, we want to now turn the low side MOSFET back on. But before we do that, we have to make sure the high side MOSFET is turned off because we can't have both MOSFETs on at the same time. That would be a short circuit from battery to ground. That would be very bad. So we turn off the high side MOSFET. And again, the current at least briefly goes through that body diode, creating some high power dissipation. Yeah, but then we can safely turn on the low side MOSFET. And now when we do turn on that low side MOSFET, when we're doing the motor drive, this is where we again want to do the multi-stage current control to tune the EMC and try to minimize time going through the switching phases. And you can see on the right-hand side that profile, with the pre-charge, the charge, and the post-charge once again. And then we get to the end of the cycle and the whole thing starts all over again. We shut off the low side, the freewheeling current happens again. So this is what we mean is we have current flowing through this other secondary MOSFET in the half bridge. But you can see now on the right-hand side, these two very different control profiles needed, one for the freewheeling MOSFET and one for the active MOSFET. And of course, our gate drivers can handle these different charging profiles. But what they can also do now, because they can so tightly control these MOSFETs and have individual current charge profiles for both the high side and for the low side, you can get through this passive freewheeling mode much, much more quickly. It saves you about three quarters of a watt of power. So that's significant. Staying out of the passive freewheeling as much as possible saves you power dissipation. We've seen already switching losses, and now we're saving on freewheeling losses. So there are a lot more about switching MOSFETs than I thought, but Rick, is there anything else we should keep in mind? MOSFETs require less currents to turn on than to turn off. So here's another drawback of constant current control. If you have constant current control, you may wind up with something like this waveform I'm showing here at the top of the screen, where you get a distortion of your duty cycle. You can see in yellow the input signal, and it's a certain width. It's only 1.5 microseconds. But the output in pink is much longer than that. And that's because you know, the time needed and the current needed to charge the MOSFET is different than the current you need to discharge the MOSFET. And especially at very low duty cycles, you can wind up with this distortion where what you're putting in is not what you're getting out. And you can see that the green is actually, the, there's the gate charge, and then the blue is actually the turn on, turn off waveform there. So what's happening here, to turn the device on, to get to this plateau in the middle of the chart on the left, it only takes you know, a certain amount of charge. So the area under the curve that's really you know, the gate charge, you only need about seven and a half nanocoulombs to reach the turn on threshold. But once the gate charge keeps going up past 5 volts, 6 volts, 7 volts, 8 volts, and the gate gets fully charged, to turn it off again, on the right-hand side, you see now, again, the area under the curve is much greater to get back down to this threshold of turnoff. So you get some asymmetry if you're using constant current, the same current charge and discharge. So with the adaptive MOSFET control, you are configuring it based upon timing. So if you tell it to turn on in this amount of time and turn off in that amount of time, the gate driver will self-adapt. And you can see this now in the green waveform. There's actually these peaks. You can see the, the three phases there, the pre-charge, the charge, and the post-charge on the left-hand side. And then when we go to the turn-off phase, you can see this very large negative spike. So it's pulling as much current as needed. And now you can see the yellow input signal and the pink output signal, the timing of those two much, much more closely matched than they were in the example up above. And you can really see it in the blue waveform as well. So now the duty cycle is properly reflected, and this helps reduce conduction losses. So less time conducting equals lower power dissipation. So Rick, to recap, what are the biggest ways adaptive MOSFET control can reduce power dissipation? Okay, so we saw first we can reduce switching losses. Our example, we pull out about a watt of switching losses. We can reduce the freewheeling losses by getting out of the passive freewheeling and get to active freewheeling for longer periods of time. And that saved about three quarters of a watt. And then also conducting losses, getting to full enhancement of the MOSFET as fast as possible. And then also ensuring symmetrical switching to make sure that the MOSFET on time reflects you know, the input time as well. So that's really just reducing the time overall that we're conducting. So all those together, you can really significantly reduce the power dissipation of your application. Excellent. So the last issue on our to-do list was mitigate supply chain issues, right, Rick? How can adaptive MOSFET control help us here? A gate driver with adaptive MOSFET control can support a dual source strategy for the MOSFETs by enabling the same switching behavior from two disparate MOSFETs. So it also even compensates for MOSFET production spread or even aging. 
But let's walk through an example. So here we have a 5.8 milliohm MOSFET on the left and a 3.1 milliohm MOSFET on the right. Very, very significant difference in power handling for these MOSFETs. And the data sheets, as you can see here, these SNPs show very different gate charges needed for each device. Despite these differences in the MOSFETs, when you look at these two timing charts here now, see how the output waveform, the red and the blue down below, it's the same between these two devices. The driver is self-adjusting the charge current to compensate for these differences. So you can very easily develop a solution with two different suppliers, or if you need to switch in midlife due to some kind of a production shortfall, you can very easily get to a working solution. Fantastic. Now, Rick, what kind of microcontroller solutions would you suggest here? Of course, I would suggest an Infineon microcontroller, but the reality is that these gate drivers could work with any kind of microcontroller. So it could be something very, very simple, a uh, simple ARM-based microcontroller. In fact, we even have devices that are integrated with a microcontroller in them, our Motix MCU products that have the gate drivers and the ARM core and uh, supply and communication all in one chip. But if you were using, the, say, an Infineon uh, Traveo 2G or an Oryx, really the microcontroller almost doesn't matter because all it has to do is some very simple configuration of these devices. It's really just setting some ones and zeros in some SPI registers, and the gate driver takes care of the rest. Fantastic. Well, Rick, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? All right, sure, sure, of course. So we see that adaptive MOSFET control has enabled us to easily pass EMC testing without trial and error, without extensive software development. We've reduced power dissipation throughout the motor drive cycle, with less switching losses, less passive freewheeling, and reduced conduction times. And we see we can create a design that can accept different MOSFETs with different RDS on and different switching characteristics, but still provide the same behavior at the output, and that is mitigating supply chain issues. Look for Infineon devices with adaptive MOSFET control, and that is multi-stage slew rate control with different segments of gate charge configured through software. And which devices are these? Our Motix family of solutions for low-voltage automotive motor drive includes many devices, many different levels of integration from gate driver ICs, smart half bridges, and H bridges, our unique combination of a system basis chip and gate driver, and our highly integrated Motix MCU products, formerly known as ePower. And all of these devices are in production and can be found at www.infineon.com. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Rick. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.